Hello everyone. If you don't know who I am, my name's Neil. I'm from Tenerife Family Church. First of all, I want to give a big warm hello, not just from me, but from everyone here in Tenerife. We hope you're safe. We hope you're well. And don't be jealous just because we're here in this lovely island with beautiful sunshine, because actually we've been cooped up in our house the same as you guys. Uh, just recently we were allowed out now for an hour a day to do some exercise, which I'm really, really grateful for. But I'm here first to, um, to give you a psalm. It's Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they reveal knowledge. They have no speech, they use no words, no sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens God has pitched a tent for the sun. It's like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of heaven and makes a circuit to the other. Nothing is deprived of its warmth. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commandments of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm and all of them are righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. By them your servant is warned. In keeping them there is great reward. But who can discern their own errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, innocent of great transgression. May these words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my rock, my redeemer. I'm going to pray now, pray for Ian as he is about to give us the word. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for Ian's life. We thank you for the work that you've done in him. We thank you for the gifts you've placed on him. We pray, Lord, that the word that you've placed on his heart to give us today will enter into us and create change. We pray for ears to hear. We pray for receptive hearts. That the precious word that you're about to give us will have an impact on us. Changing us into the likeness of your son, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Hello everyone, welcome. It's great to be able to be together. I know we can't physically be in the same space, but it is amazing with the wonders of modern technology that we can stream and uh, we might be sitting in our living room or in our bedroom or in our kitchen and yet we can still be together. We can still have that sense of being part of a, a greater community. Um, wasn't it wonderful to have Neil giving the reading from Tenerife? He's a lovely, lovely guy. He's one of the leaders there. He's actually a really good preacher, so maybe one week we should get a preach from Tenerife. And thank you to Kerry and the whole Restore Kids team that are doing such an amazing job putting together those family resources. And I really would encourage you, if you haven't used them yet, do you know, as an adult, you could try using them as well if you want to. It'd be great to download them and to use them. Um, now, I'm going to continue today with our House to House series. Uh, if you tuned in for the last few weeks, you'll know that we're looking at the book of Acts. The reason that we've decided to do that is in the book of Acts, uh, the Holy Spirit moved and the church went beyond just meeting um, in one place in the temple for worship. But actually, they experienced God working in their houses. And it talks in chapter two about them literally breaking bread from house to house. And our prayer for this season is that although it is a most extraordinary season, something that we've never walked through before, that actually in the midst of it, there'll be an opportunity to encounter God and for Jesus to do a deep work in all of our lives. And that's what we're praying for. That's what we're asking God for. And that's what we're looking for over these weeks. If you tuned in over the last few weeks, you'll know that our theme verse is Acts chapter 2, verse 42. So we're drawing out some of the key things that the early church focused on in a to enable God to continue to work in them. So Acts 2 verse 42 says that they continually devoted themselves 
to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Now, I don't know what you feel like you're continually devoting yourself to. I know for some people, um, life is still very, very crazy, trying to juggle uh, the demands of homeschooling or kids out of school and also full-time work. I know for other people, uh, there's a real temptation to devote uh, yourself to Netflix or to whatever is hanging around in the fridge if you manage to get some food. Um, But in the early church, they devoted themselves to key things that enabled God to work deeply in all of their lives. And so over the last few weeks, we started off by looking at the fact that it's really good to have a plan and to have a focus. I was talking to someone this week, and they've got a little book. And at the end of each day, they write in the book the things that they've achieved. Because it's so easy, if you're not able to work at the moment, to feel like, where did the time just go? And for them, at the end of each day, to be able to write down some of the simple things they've achieved helps them know that they haven't just wasted time, that actually they have been able to still be productive. And I'm a big fan of planning. So I think it's always good to be able to plan um, and to have some kind of focus for a season because that helps uh, lead us and uh, keep us uh, boundaried into the things that we feel that God's spoken to us. Jody then spoke about uh, breaking bread and I want to encourage you, let's keep doing that. Maybe when you have lunch today, you want to get some grape juice uh, or some uh, Ribena and some bread and as a family or on your own just to use that time to take communion and use it as an encounter moment with Jesus and then Stuart was talking last week about fellowship and that does seem a strange thing to be talking about when we can't physically meet together but you know what we can be creative and still be engaged in relationship I love some of the photos that you see on Facebook about people having virtual meals together and there's a number of families that I know that have been gathering online to have uh, quizzes Uh, Someone this week ordered a Cadbury's chocolate delivery to our doorstep, which was very welcome. That's our love language as the king's uh, Cadbury's dairy milk. So that was a great gift. I know other people are really prioritizing uh, not doing so many emails, but actually picking up a phone and ringing someone. And maybe a good thing to ask this week is, who can I connect with? And God, what is the best way for me to be a blessing and to have meaningful relationship with someone else? And I think that's a good thing for us to be pressing into. But today we're going to move on and we're going to talk about this. We're going to talk about the Word of God. Now, I love the Word of God. I'm really passionate about the Word of God. And one thing that I know is the Word of God is really powerful into our lives. At the very beginning of the creation story in Genesis chapter 1, when God kicks off the whole creation process, he does it by speaking a word. And in Proverbs uh, chapter 19, we know that uh, death and life is in the power of our words, the power of the tongue. So there's real creative power in the word of God. Psalm 1 tells us how blessed is the man whose delight is the word of God and who meditates on it day and night. And it says that he's like a tree and he bears fruit in in, in its season. Its leaves never uh, 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 fade and um, whatever he does prospers. And so even in this season, which is a season of challenge, if we're rooted in the word of God, there's so much life and power in it, we can still thrive and uh, still be people who bear good fruit for God. Jesus in John chapter 8 says, you will know the truth and the truth shall make you free. And so there's incredible creative power in the word of God. Uh, One of the verses that I love is 2 uh, Timothy chapter 3. Uh, We're going to bring it up on your screens right now. This is the message version of it. But uh, the Apostle Paul writes to Timothy, his uh, uh, protege, he writes to him, every part of scripture is God-breathed and useful one way or another, showing us truth, exposing our rebellion, correcting our mistakes, training us to live God's way. Through the word, we are put together and shaped up for the tasks God has given us. And you can see from that verse, incredible power to bring transformation and change into our lives simply by being rooted into God's word. Now, one of the people who uh, I really love in terms of a preacher and a writer and author from the States is a guy called John Bevere. 
And he's very passionate about God's word. And he set up a project called Bible Matters, which is all about uh, helping people to get into the word of God today. And they did some research on the power of the word of God. And we're just going to play a video of John interviewing a guy who's just downloading the results of that research. And I think you'll be amazed and surprised by some of the things that come out. So watch this video right now. There was a recent study by the Center for Bible Engagement where they pulled 40,000 uh, p- uh, general population in the U.S. from 8 to 80. And they just wanted to see how we are engaging with Scripture. Right. And they discovered something that actually became kind of the profound discovery of the entire study. It, they weren't even looking for this, and this is kind of became the highlight of the study. Right. Um, when we're in the scripture one time a week, and that could be church on Sunday, that's pastor saying you open your Bible, we hear the message, one time a week had negligible effect on some key areas of your life. So I'll, I'm going to spell that out more here in a moment. Two times a week, negligible effect. Now at three times a week, there was a blip on the map, like there was a heartbeat. Something happened, again, a heartbeat. Okay. But here was the profound discovery. When we're in the scripture four times a week, it literally spikes off the chart. You would expect that it'd be one, two, th- I mean, there'd be a gradual incline right. on the effect and impact that would have in your life, but it was literally one, two, three, four, something radically happens. Okay, you got my curiosity. To this what, extent. What kind of behavior is being affected? Feeling lonely drops 30%. Wow, Ang- like four times a week in the four Bible. Four times a week in the Bible. Okay. Anger issues drop 32%. Uh, bitterness in relationships, marriage, a relationship with your kids, and so on, drops 40%. Alcoholism drops Crazy. 57%. Feeling spiritually stagnant. You know, if there was one area when I'm talking with people that, that they'll be honest about is they just feel spiritually stagnant. Ask them the question, how much time are you spending in Scripture? If they're in the Scripture four times a week or more, it drops 60%. Wow. Viewing pornography drops 61%. That's very important. Now, on a flip positive side, sharing your faith wow. jumps 200%. Wow. Because you have a confidence in God's word. And then discipling others jumps 230%. That's, that's amazing right there. That's some really interesting results, isn't it? I was surprised when I read that. Um, partly of, about the power of the Word of God, but also I was really struck by the fact that it takes, on average, at least four times a week in the Word of God to really see life change happen. And it really set me thinking, I wonder how good we are at really, really rooting ourselves and finding that time regularly in our week to be rooted in the Word of God. And I wonder whether we don't see the life change because actually we've never managed to do that. And I think for many of us, we understand that the word of God is powerful. We understand it can bring incredible change in our lives. But actually finding a way of unlocking that power, finding a way of the word becoming alive, actually is quite a challenge to us. And I get that because uh, I love uh, crime novels. I love a good John Grisham thriller. And that's easy to read. You can start at the beginning and it becomes a real page turner. And I get that in the Bible, it isn't always that simple because we start at the beginning at Genesis, there's some great stories. We get into Exodus, there's some really, really good stories. And then we get into Leviticus, and it's, what on earth is going on here? And this seems quite dry. And I think for many people, it's been a challenge to get ourselves rooted into the Word of God. Well, my prayer for today is that I might help to um, uh, give you some good pointers into how we can get into the Word of God. And that over this season, maybe some of us can introduce some new practices that will better help us be rooted in the Word of God and therefore get some of the benefits in terms of the life transformation that clearly can happen from being rooted in the Scripture. Um, When we look in the New Testament, there's actually two words that are used for uh, the word of God, uh, two Greek words. One is the word uh, logos, and the other is the word rima. Now, the word logos is the most commonly used New Testament word, and it occurs 316 times in the New Testament. And the word logos means the entire or the complete uh, word of God. 
The word rhema is less frequently used. It occurs in the New Testament 67 times. And the word rhema is much more a specific or a personal word that God speaks to you. So logos is the overarching word of God. And rhema is the now, the individual. This is God speaking to me. Some people have said it's a little bit like the keys on a piano. And the, and the logos is kind of uh, the whole keyboard, every uh, note that is possible to be played. Uh, and the rhema is like the note that God is playing or the chord that God is sounding right now that he's wanting to speak into our individual lives. And when we unpack that in terms of Bible verses, in John chapter 1, verse 1, where it says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, then the word that's used there is the word logos, because Jesus is the fullness of the word of God expressed in a man. And John 1 verse 14, the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. Again, that's the logos. And so our easy starting point for understanding the word of God is to look at the life of Jesus. And if you're not familiar with the Bible or you haven't uh, read it as much recently as you ought to, then a good starting point is start by reading the Gospels and the story of Jesus. And it gives us a good picture, a good overview, a good logos view of the overarching word of God. Now, the word rhema is a much more individual one. So in Mark chapter 14, when the cock crows after Peter is denied Jesus, it says in Mark's account of it, it says, Peter remembered the word that Jesus had spoken to him. And the word that is used there is rhema, because it was an individual, it was a personal word that God spoke to Peter um, at that particular time. And it's really important that we have both that overarching word of God, but also the individual, here's what God's speaking to me. It's interesting in uh, Romans chapter 10, verse 17, where it says, faith comes by hearing and hearing from the word of God. Again, that's rhema. That's God speaking right now into my life. And the sword of the spirit in Ephesians chapter 6, that well-known uh, passage where Paul talks about the armor of God that we're to put on each day. The sword of the spirit that is the word of God, again, is the rhema word of God. And so if we're going to line ourselves up to the New Testament and a good understanding of the word of God, we've got to do two things regularly. One is we've got to get a good understanding of the whole of the word of God. It says in uh, Acts chapter 17, when Paul came to Berea, it says uh, the disciples uh, in uh, that town, it says they were infused by the word of God that Paul uh, spoke to them. But it also says every day they examine the scriptures to see if what Paul was saying was true. And if we root ourselves in the overarching word of God, it equips us to be able to test what we hear and see whether that is true or not. Now, in Restore, we're really passionate about the Word of God. We're really passionate about good theology. And that's important to us. But you should never take what we say as 100% definite truth. We do the best we possibly can to present the Word of God as accurately as we possibly can. But we're still learning, and we can be fallible, and we can get some things wrong. Like I say, we make every effort to make sure that we don't, that we provide really good teaching. But the only way to really know or to examine any teaching that you're hearing is if you've got a good understanding of the logos, the entirety of the Word of God for yourself. But it also says uh, that as well as a good overarching view, then we need to be good at hearing what God is wanting to take from the page of scripture and speak what's God's word for me right here and right now. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, Jesus says, man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word, and the word that's used there is the rhema, every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So this morning, I want to use the rest of the time to talk about how we can get into the logos and a good overall understanding of the word of God. But I also want to talk a little bit about how we can get more of the rhema and God speaking to us. And when I get to that bit, you're going to do the work as well. So this isn't a morning to just sit and watch and listen to Ian. Actually, I'm going to make you do some of the work because God wants to speak to you individually today. And God wants to help equip you so that you're confident that you can hear what God is speaking from the word of God. So we can then make it a regular, a daily discipline. Now, there's no shortcuts to understanding the whole word of God. Actually, we've got to discipline ourselves to read it. 
When I first started to read the Bible, and I understood that was something I needed to do, I got one of those books, one of those Bible in one year, and I realized that nearly all of those Bible in one year, they start on the 1st of January and they go through to the end of the year. Now, I thought that's a great idea. You know, beginning of January, that's a time for New Year resolutions. I'll make a New Year's resolution. I'm going to read my uh, two chapters from the Old Testament, a psalm, uh, a chapter from the New Testament. And this year, I'm going to get through the Bible. Now, what happened to me on several successive years is that by about March, I was several days behind. In fact, probably several weeks behind. And what had set out to be an encouraging exercise had actually become a discouraging exercise. And maybe you've had a similar experience to me in that. Well, then one day I suddenly realized what I needed to do was I needed to get a Bible reading plan that didn't have a day, a fixed day in the calendar it was tied to. And then it wouldn't matter if I fell behind, and I wouldn't open it and instantly feel guilty and a pressure to catch up. And actually, God wasn't going to mind if I took 15 or 16 months to get through the Bible. The key thing is I was making progress to get through the Bible. And I would say for me, once I got to that place and started to regularly and as much as possible find a daily opportunity to read the Bible, or at least, as we heard earlier, four days a week, to read from the Bible, then I started to grow in my overall understanding of scripture. Now, I want to recommend some tools that I think could really help us all in this season to get ourselves rooted in the word of God, the logos of God. The first thing I'd recommend is the Bible app. Now, the Bible app is free. You can get it on, you can download it onto your computer, onto your phone, onto your uh, iPad, whatever you use, you can download it. Now, what's amazing about the Bible app is it doesn't just contain the Bible on it or loads of different uh, translations of the Bible on it. Actually, it's stacked full of Bible reading plans. And included in those Bible reading plans are uh, ways that you can read the Bible in a year that aren't fixed to any particular calendar date. And so I would recommend if you don't uh, ordinarily have as a regular practice in your life a discipline of reading the Bible and working your way through the Bible, then I would suggest that you look on the Bible app, download it onto your phone, uh, sign up to one of those daily reading plans and then start to use it. And if it would help you to be accountable, why not find a friend, someone else in the church, or if you're in a small group, someone in your small group, and you can make yourself accountable to them. Actually, you could agree together to use the, uh, the same reading plan, and then you can check up on one another as well. But I think that's a really, really helpful way of disciplining us to regularly work through the word of God. The second thing that I would recommend is the right now media stuff that Jody talked about earlier. Now, the reason we signed up for this and we've made it available to everyone free of charge is there's amazing, amazing Bible studies on it. In fact, over 24,000 Bible studies on it. So it'd be very hard to say I can't find one that I like with 24,000 available and actually 24,000 available for all ages. As Jody said, we're going to point you towards some particularly helpful resources on there. I'm going to point you towards two things that I think are well worth signing up to, and you can make them a part of your channel uh, once you've logged in on, uh, on the media. So number one, the Bible uh, books, the Bible overviews that they have. Now, they have a number of Bible overviews. It's not the Bible project yet, so ignore that. It's the Bible overviews that they have. And they have people like Francis Chan does a Bible overview of the book of Mark. Uh, I'm looking at the moment a uh, fantastic uh, Bible overview uh, of uh, 1 Corinthians, uh, led through by a lady called Jenny Allen. And what they basically do is each day you get a, a six or seven minute video and they take a chapter or a chapter and a half from a book of the Bible um, and uh, they read some of it with you and they give some good teaching, some good context to it, and they give some good thoughts that they draw out of it. And so it's a really good way of doing a daily devotion. And actually, if you see ahead of time which chapter they're going to look at, you can read it in your Bible. Then you can tune in, watch the video, and it really helps unlock it and gives you some uh, uh, points that you can take away to be part of the application that brings life change. 
So I'd look at the books of the Bible, as I say, people like Francis Chan, Jenny Allen doing it, Louis Giglio as well, really, really top-notch uh, Bible teaching and all beautifully filmed and photographed as well. The other channel that is worth tuning into is the Bible Project channel. Now, I'm hoping that our chat stream hosts are on it, in which case the uh, uh, references for this should be coming up and uh, the links to uh, click on to be able to find the channel should be coming up. The Bible Project is put together by a couple of theologians in the States and uh, their aim is to make the Bible really accessible for the everyday person. And they've got loads of great resources, but in particular, what I love is they have overviews of every single book of the Bible. And uh, the way that they're worked is everyone is between about five and seven minutes long and they have a blank piece of paper, and gradually they draw out the overview of the book. And they make it really simple and really accessible, but it's full of really good theology and really good revelation as well. I'm learning something because I'm doing it. And so at the moment, my uh, regular Bible reading is as follows. Um, I'm doing some regular study from the book of Exodus. So I'm reading a chapter of the book of Exodus each day. Then I'm watching, as I say, the Jenny Allen uh, six or seven minutes on the book of 1 Corinthians. And I'm watching a Bible project overview of each book in the Bible, one at a time. I've just finished Ezra and Nehemiah, which is fantastic. And so I'd really encourage you to look at those. Now, you might find some other resources as well, but they're a really good starting point in terms of the right now media. And it's a really good way that we can get an overarching view of the logos of the word of God. So that's one part of rooting ourselves in God's word. The other part of rooting ourselves in God's word, God's word is using the word as a means for God to speak to us, that we might know what God is saying to us right here, right now, that we might receive our rhema word from God. And we're going to have a go at doing that now with the word of God. And so I've uh, pre-selected a passage of scripture from Mark chapter 10, and it's the story of blind Bartimaeus receiving his sight. It's only seven verses long. So in a moment, we're going to read this, and then we're going to use a structure that I love for helping us get something out of the Word of God, which is called a a Discovery Bible Study. Now, a Discovery Bible Study is a really simple tool, and you basically do three things. You read the chapter, or or you read the story, first of all, and then you ask three questions. Number one, what does this passage tell me about Jesus? Number two... What does this passage tell me about people or about myself? And number three, what do I need to do as a response? So three really simple questions. What does this passage tell me about Jesus? What does this passage tell me about people or myself? And number three, what do I need to do as a response? And uh, we're going to have a go at doing a Discovery Bible study for the next 10 minutes or so, and then Vickers will come back and lead us in some more worship. And as I say, we're going to use the story from Mark chapter 10, verse 46, of blind Bartimaeus receiving his sight. You don't need to look it up in your Bible because it's going to come on the screen in front of you. And can I suggest that rather me, than just me read it, why don't we read it out loud together? Because it will help you to get hold of the story, which will give you a greater opportunity for God being able to speak into your life a rhema word this morning. So it says as follows, you ready to speak it with me or to read it with me? Then they came to Jericho as Jesus and his disciples together with a large crowd were leaving the city. A blind man, Bartimaeus, which means son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and said, call him. So they called to the blind man, cheer up on your feet, he's calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Go, said Jesus, your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. That's a great story, isn't it? 
And as I say, we're going to use the Discovery Bible Study approach to unpacking that story for God to speak to us today. But the first thing I want you to do is I want you to see whether in the, in the next minute, whether you can recount that story without reading it from the screen. So if you're at home on your own, just speak to your television set as if you're talking to me. If you're in a group of people or a family this morning, why don't one member of the family just recite that story and then everyone else add bits into it if they've forgotten it. And it's one of the ways that we can take a story and make it start to live. And so uh, let's uh, use these next few moments and let's speak out that story, someone in the room, Tell that story and tell what you think you've heard from that story. Speak it out right now. Now, is there anything else that needs to be added to the story? I'm not adding to scripture. We're just reminding or picking up on some bits that we might have forgotten. And as I say, in the time of Jesus, they didn't have written scriptures that people could read. And so they were used to orally hearing. And it helps us to pay attention if we then have to recite what we've just read. And so hopefully you got the fact there's a guy called Bartimaeus, lived in Jericho. Uh, the crowds tried to quieten him down. Uh, Jesus heard his cries. He wanted to be healed. Jesus healed him. And then he decided to follow Jesus. That's the basics of the story. Now, before we dip into the questions, it is worth just taking a few more moments to see uh, whether there's some more details of that we can just unpack that will help us get into the fullness of the story. And some of the details I'm talking about are questions like, where did the story happen? Now, the story happened where? In Jericho. Okay, what's the history of Jericho? What else might be good to look up and read about uh, what had happened previously in Jericho, because Jericho was a significant city, wasn't it? Joshua fit the Battle of Jericho, and the walls came tumbling down. Uh, Joshua chapters 6 and 7. So we know it's got a history. Another thing that's worth thinking about is the names in the story. Now, it's not just Elon Musk that can give a child a name that for them has a significance but is a little bit weird. Uh, in the Bible, a lot of the names uh, are a little bit weird, but actually they mean something. And so you could look up the meaning of the name Bartimaeus. Bartimaeus actually means son of honor. And one of the things we see in the story is that Jesus treats him with much honor when other people don't. Another thing, if you've got a bit more time, is you might want to read the story behind it or the story before it and the story after it, because then you're putting it in a context. And obviously, in the Gospels, the author was writing a whole story. And sometimes what's written before or after links to the same thing. And it, actually, if we looked at the story earlier, we won't today because of a shortage of time. If you looked at the story earlier, the immediate before story is the story of James and John coming to Jesus and saying, Jesus, if we ask you to do whatever we want, will you do it? And Jesus asks them exactly the same question. And he says, what do you want me to do for you? And they say, we want the place of highest honor. We want to be first. We want to be at your right and left in glory. And Jesus says no to them. But then he says the same question to Bartimaeus. And he says yes to Bartimaeus. Now, when we understand that, we know that there's something in this passage about how we need to approach Jesus if we're going to get our prayers answered. And so, again, it's just worth thinking around the story a little bit. And then after you've done that, it's worth simply asking those three questions. Number one, what does this story show us about Jesus? Number two, what does it show us about ourselves? And number three, what do we need to do as a result? So again, in your living room, you can, uh, if you're on your own, you can write your answers on the chat if you want to, or you can shout them at the TV, uh, and I'll pretend that I can hear what you're saying. Uh, if you're in the lounge with other people, why don't you say it together and share some of your answers together? So from this story of Bartimaeus, what does it tell us about Jesus? Not going to give prizes for the most answers. What does it tell us about Jesus? Well, a couple of simple answers that I would draw out of the story. Number one, Jesus can heal. And if he can heal a blind man, then he can heal every sickness and disease. Maybe this morning you need healing. Well, you've come to the right place. 
because Jesus is speaking and Jesus is at work and Jesus is willing and able to bring healing. What is another thing that comes out of the story? Well, Jesus hears our every cry. Talked about the history of Jericho. Jericho actually never should have been rebuilt and God pronounced a curse on Jericho if it was rebuilt. And so you would think it would be a place that Jesus might have ignored. And given the crowd tried to shut Bartimaeus up, you might have thought that Jesus would have passed him by. But the least cry from the least individual in the most forlorn city, the Son of God still hears. Wherever you are this morning, whatever your history, whatever you might be feeling at the moment, Jesus knows and he hears the cries of your heart and he's willing to do something about it to bring life change. Just a couple of simple things that we've drawn out because we've asked the question, what does this show me about Jesus? Our second question, what does this show us about us? What can we learn from Bartimaeus? So just in your group or on the chat stream right now, do you want to write what struck you, what we can learn from Bartimaeus from this story? Did you come up with some good answers? Again, I'll give you a couple. Um, it's interesting in the story, Bartimaeus is called the son of Timaeus. And then when Jesus passes by, he calls him the son of God. So we've got a son of man who meets the son of God and the son of man is transformed. And so one of the things we can learn about Bartimaeus is if we see who Jesus really is, and remember, Bartimaeus was a blind man, and yet he had revelation. He had insight into who Jesus was. And when he had revelation and insight that Jesus was the son of David, he was the Messiah, it was a key to life change. And so if we ask God to reveal more of himself to us today, that will be a key to us seeing life change. Another thing you could draw out the story, the crowd tried to shut Bartimaeus up, but he kept calling out. He kept crying out. For some of us, maybe what we need to hear today is God saying, don't give up. Keep trying. Be persistent. Keep knocking on the door. And then you'll see breakthrough. Another thing that comes out of the passage is Bartimaeus threw away his beggar's cloak as he went up to encounter Jesus. For some of us today, maybe God's saying, you need to let go of that. You need to let go of that bit of your identity. You need to let go of that bit of your history. You need to let go of that distraction if you're going to be able to meet with me and you're going to be able to receive all the things that I want you to do. So again, just a few simple things. You probably came up with your own. I'm going to look through the chat thread uh, later and uh, maybe discover who some of our budding preachers for the future are when we read some of the, the best answers. And the last question is simply, what do I need to do now as a response? So we've seen that Jesus is a healer. We've seen that Jesus hears our every cry. We've seen that Jesus wants to show us more of who he is. We've seen that Jesus uh, wants to uh, lead us through a process of letting go of stuff to encounter more of him. What of those words, or what of what you discovered this morning, is your rhema word, is your thing that God is speaking to you right here and right now? Because in a moment, we're going to pray because he's going to come up and start to lead worship again. And we're going to ask God to move significantly and bring about change in our lives because we've heard the now word of God to us, each one of us as individuals. When I was praying over this yesterday, I felt that God said, pray for healing this morning. And so wherever you are, whatever's going on in your life at the moment, if you need physical healing, I'm going to pray and we're going to trust God for him to come and move and release healing. If you're happy to or able to, why don't you just put your hand on the part of your body that needs healing? I had a couple of words of knowledge. I felt that God was saying that there's someone tuning in today and you've been having heart palpitations. And it might be anxiety related or it might be something else, but actually you've been too frightened because of the current situation to tell anyone or get checked out. And I believe that God wants to bring healing to you today. Uh, the second thing I sensed is I sensed that for some people, um, there's some people watching and you have eye problems. 
a physical eye problem. And just as we've been reading a story about Jesus healing blindness, believe that God wants to bring healing to your eyes. Uh, don't, we're not just going to be restricted by that, though. I'm going to pray for those particular two conditions. But any and everything else, we're going to pray for Jesus to move and bring healing right now. So let's close our eyes. Let's reach out to Jesus and let's invite his spirit to come. Lord Jesus, thank you that one of the things that we learn from this scripture is you are a God who heals. And Lord, we pray that your healing will come right now. Father, I take authority over every heart condition and I bind it and I break it in the mighty name of Jesus. And we take authority over blindness and every eye infection and every eye condition. And we say you will give way to the healing power of Jesus. And we loose now the power of the Spirit of God to bring healing and restoration. And Father, in these moments, we pray for every other pain. We pray for every other physical sickness. We pray for every other pain, inner pain of the heart. And right now, we release your peace. We release your comfort. We release your supernatural healing power and we say be healed in Jesus name and I'm just going to pray one more thing but I'm going to pray that for each one of us God will release a fresh hunger for his word and his word will come alive in our lives more in this next season than ever before father I thank you for the power of your word Thank you that your word has the power to bring life change. And Father, I pray for every one of us right now. And I pray, Father, that you will reawaken a hunger and a thirst for you and a hunger and a thirst for your word. And I pray in this season you will unlock the power of your word in our life at a whole new level. Lord, let us have a fresh passion to get into the logos of your word, the overall uh, understanding of your word. But Father as well, may your spirit speak and may your word live. And may each day us know that rhema word, God speaking regularly into all of our lives. In Jesus' name. Amen. One of the themes of scripture is the combination of the word of God with the spirit of God. And I've been speaking the word of God. God's been speaking to many of our hearts. Because he's going to pick up in worship, we're going to invite the spirit of God to come. And let's let God continue to worship and minister in our lives. If it helps you to stand up, stand up. If you want to lie on the floor and just invite the Holy Spirit to come, lie on the floor. But can I encourage you not to be passive, but to be active. And let's engage together in worshipping God and reaching out to his spirit.